Chiefs and the Eagles in the Super Bowl with a 51 point over under. The Philadelphia Eagles are one and a half point favorites. This is Showdown Coverage brought to you by SharpFootballAnalysis.com. I'm your host, Adam Wildy, joined by the connoisseur of context himself, Rich Rebar. Rich, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Adam. I'm glad we got a chance to uh, get together and, and do a little collaboration here. This is the not only the final showdown slate, it's the final game of the yep. season. So you're getting a lot of people like me that you know don't play a lot of showdown. Listen, we're all playing showdown this weekend. Everyone. Everyone's a <laughs> showdown expert this week. <laughs> But I'm here, man. You, I, I'm here to learn from you, uh, provide my analysis here, uh, paired with kind of your knowledge of attacking the shit on slate and hoping we can put a good marriage of closing out the season with some, you know, some money in our pocket. Awesome. Also, well, the, one of the most important things about showdown is uh, who's going to win because we find at like a 60 percent or more rate. The winning team is usually favored in your uh, in your lineups. You're usually going to have four of uh, or five or five, we'll talk about some of that today, of those players in your lineups, especially if it's going to be a um, touchdown or, or more um, lead. So who, who do you have one in this game? I mean, this has been kind of a, a back and forth, like internal struggle for me. I actually have not even yeah. bet the a side in this game because obviously if you're betting the Chiefs, you're just going to money line them at one and a half points anyways. But right. uh, I've attacked this from different angles. You know, uh, I like the first half over. I like both first half team totals and, you know, mixed in a player prop stuff. But really, man, even writing this game up and thinking it was going to illuminate like a strong stance yeah. for me in this game. I keep finding edges like for each team ever. I'm like, all right, here's something for the Eagles. And I'm like, this is going to lean into this. And I'm like, oh man, but this for the Chiefs. And this is only the fourth Super Bowl we've had since the NFL expanded to 32 teams that is less than a touchdown point spread. Uh, huh. So over 20 years, it's just the fourth time. It's also just the fourth time over those 20 years we've had two offenses that were both top five in DVOA than the okay. season entering the Super Bowl, which is pretty wild to think about when you think about teams that are left over in the Super Bowl. But typically we have a, a better defense left over. Now the Eagles have kind of one of each, but uh, we – We've got this high point total for the reason of we don't really see a lot of these when we get to this point of the season, two like kind of really elite offenses left over. Right. Uh, two high scoring offenses in the league, actually, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the one and a half point um, spread, I mean, actually, it started as Chiefs, right? Wasn't a, it opened at um, minus one for the Chiefs? So uh, books don't really seem to know either. So we can kind of pick or choose our sides, but these are my favorite slates when you can do that, because then you get to take a stance and you get to really hone in on um, like, what does the value give you? Uh, what is everybody else going to do? Things like that. So something I do think is going to be popular is Eagles. Uh, the Eagles have good value. Mm -hmm. They are favored in the game, which a lot of optimizers do way into um, who's going to be popping in your lineups, things like that. So we will talk about a lot of different ways to, to still run the Eagles because I do think that Eagles heavy lineups are going to be the route to take uh, their, the ownership just works out really nicely for these guys. The, um, the basically how the ball gets spread around is really, really projectable for them. It's going to be a little more difficult with like, we'll get to Kadaris. Tony's going to be a really tough one. Does MVS repeat? Like a lot of things are going to be really difficult to project for the chiefs. And that's going to make the Eagles really cozy for us. So how do we yeah. get to be comfy cozy with our uh, Eagle stacks and still be unique? That's going to be something that we're going to have to attack. Uh, the first thing is, is Jalen hurts right there at the top at 11,200, but DraftKings does a really good job of saying, Hey, you, you're going to have to pick. We're not going to make it easy for you with Patrick Mahomes right there. Only $200 less. So you really start at quarterback and build your way out. Um, do you have an edge for either of these quarterbacks, regardless of how you think the game's going to turn out? Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to think from, from a pure fantasy stance, this Jalen hurts has a lot more outs uh, than, than Patrick sure. Mahomes. I sure. mean, you look at the, you know, Patrick Mahomes in this, this is his third Super Bowl, and it's also his third Super Bowl facing kind of uh, a defense that was top five in DVOA against the pass. Uh, okay. Obviously, Tampa Bay was fifth in 2020. 49ers were uh, second in the NFL in 2019. The Eagles are fifth now. And you can talk about who the Eagles have faced to this point and, you know, kind of maybe, you know, throw yeah. some shade uh, in that department. But, you know, Mahomes has thrown multiple interceptions in both those Super Bowls. He's gone under his yardage prop in both of those Super Bowls. Uh, he, We don't know how much he's going to run, right, with the ankle. He does have an extra week. With, um, sure. 
but so like Jalen Hurts can have a very pedestrian passing game and still be a strong fantasy play because of the rushing equity equity and the touchdown equity is he's minus odds to have an anytime touchdown, right, which is absurd right. for a quarterback to, yep. to have. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is absurd. But the the thing about um, when you open up the um, so Konami code, right? Konami yeah. code quarterback. <laughs> so when you open up that bag of worms in showdown, then you uh, spiral off on all of these different uh, branches, if you will, yeah. of how you're going to attack Jalen Hurts lineups. Because if Jalen Hurts runs for two touchdowns, he ends up with a vastly different supporting cast in the optimal lineup than mm-hmm. if he throws for three touchdowns. I will say in all of the showdown lineups uh, or showdown slates in the past with the Eagles, people are way more comfortable single stacking and double stacking Jalen Hurts. And we have seen 300-yard bonus games out of Jalen Hurts this season. Maybe not so much as late of late with the shoulder, but I would argue that he hasn't been pushed at all of late. Um, since this shoulder injury, really, he hasn't been pushed to do anything through the air, and he still had some pretty efficient games. This game's going to be a lot different. The same's going to go for Miles Sanders when we get for him. This game's going to be a lot different than a lot of the games that they've had in recent weeks. So Jalen Hurts lineups are going to be, the vast majority are going to be like maybe Sanders and um, one or two of his receivers. I think people are going to be really comfortable with like AJ Brown and someone cheap like Pascal or Quez Watkins or something like that. But people don't really want to do AJ Brown, Devonta Smith, and Dallas Goddard, something like that. That takes up so much salary in your lineup, and that requires a a very very efficient game out of Jalen Hurts. But that's how I'm going to have. That's how I'm going to be attacking this game. I'm going to take some of the tendencies from earlier this season, throughout the season with Jalen Hurts, and just hope that well. I'm not willing to fade Jalen Hurts. Um, in fact, I'm going to play him at captain a ton. So if I'm playing Jalen Hurts at captain, how am I going to be unique with him at captain? It's probably going to be by stacking him with at least two of his expensive pass catchers and then going from there with the rest of the lineup. But but with, with Jalen Hurts at captain and two of his expensive pass catchers, now you've backed yourself into a bit of a corner because – You're all in on the Eagles at that point. And that's how I kind of landed on, okay, I'm going to come into this show really just heavily. Let's figure out how to get this Eagles thing working. Because once you've gone the route of, I'm going Jalen Hurts, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, A.J. Brown, it's a passing game. Uh, Now what do you – like? so people are going to try to jam in Mahomes and Kelsey with Hurts and a pass catcher. And uh, when you and I go to build later, uh, I'll show what – most lineups are going to start with for people who are going to do, you know, willing to play the chalk and and chop with a bunch of people, but that's going to be very, it's going to be tough. So I just want to take the time to remind people that if you do go five by one, which is a route, that's going to end up what we're going to end up taking here at some point, just strongly consider the Eagles defense, because before we kick off the rest of the, the, the players, we're not going to talk about the defense as a ton. Because it's a 51 point over under with the two highest scoring offenses in the league, but the Eagles get a ton of pressure, right? And they get home on a lot of their pressure. So, do you have any feelings toward, I guess, do you have any feelings towards either of the defense? Because that'll kind of shape how we go forward. I mean, it's with high totals. I mean, sometimes it's a, you know, that pushes people off of team defense. Yeah. But oh, team, yeah. But it's, you're getting a lot more dropbacks and score. Remember, total points don't really factor in defensive scoring a ton. Yeah, pretty much. Not. We want to, we want shots at turnovers. We want shots at, you know, defensive touchdowns, right? And right. there's probably going to be a decent amount. There's a lot of avenues for a lot of dropbacks in this game. Uh, You know, obviously, if the Chiefs go ahead early, the Eagles have not been pressed to throw the football, especially in the second half of games. Jalen Hurts has 22 total pass attempts this season trailing in the second half, right? Like (laughs) 22. Like, think about how crazy that is. Like, it's an absurd – the entire NFL season, he's got 22 passes trailing. So, if the Chiefs are up, like, we have not seen the Eagles put in this type of situation, right? And we know the Chiefs are going to be aggressive anyways. Under Patrick Mahomes in the postseason – their pass rate actually goes up 4% from their regular season rate. Like when the, when, when the chips are on the table, yeah. they're, they trust their best player. So there is a shot for a lot of dropbacks, which could lead to potential for more sacks, which leads to potential for more turnovers uh, and all those things. Uh, you know, 
you know, Jonathan Bales years ago was one of the first people to uncover. Like you actually sometimes want to target, you know, defenses and higher total sites because it pushes sure. people away uh, because you just have more opportunities for those things that count for fantasy football. You know, is that almost like it's not quite the Konami code type thing where, you know, just like the scoring's weighted for a position, but sure. uh, it's kind of inverse logic, right? Like it's like, all right, it's team defense. Like what my team defense can give up 400 yards and 30 points and I can still score 15 <laughs> fantasy points. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so for me, it's boiled down to something a lot more simple than that. It's just that I'm willing to play players when other people aren't willing to play them because there is so much variance involved in showdown. So there are slates that I come into where it's just like, well, I'm not playing that. pretty much any slate that I can project. People are going to play defense at captain. I will have zero exposure to defense oh, and yeah. it's worked out most often. Um, there are cases where defense ends up being the optimal captain. That's very, very frustrating. But more often than not, if anybody's willing to play them at captain, then I sure as heck don't want to be part of the 30% roster percentage of the defense. But in, in games with high-powered offenses and with high totals, always, almost always you find that your defense is uh, underutilized. Uh, you're probably, you can probably put your defense in as one of the 20% type player. So if you're someone like me who puts like limits on your 20% players, make sure they're included in your lineups. Um, you're going to be able to include both defenses in that. So I'm actually fine with both defenses. Very happy with playing the Eagles uh, in five by one. So especially with Miles Sanders at captain, somebody who I will want captain exposure to, someone who worked out for me last week, I'm definitely interested in giving them a slight bump if your optimizer allows you to do that when you have Miles Sanders at captain. But if I'm so excited about Jalen Hurts at captain, how does Patrick Mahomes fit into all this? Because we spent all that time talking about how much, uh, at least I love Jalen Hurts. I think most people are going to love Jalen Hurts. But, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes and apparently healthy. Like, getting full practices in on Monday looks totally fine. So, what I mean, can can we fade Patrick Mahomes? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, obviously I think we've got a, uh, probably like a 50, 50 game, right? Like even looking at projected ownership for these quarterbacks, it looks pretty close. Uh, we've also seen Mahomes, you know, punch up in a number of games this year, you know, sure. uh, he faced the 49ers, he faced Denver twice. He faced Buffalo. Who's also ninth, uh, in DVA against the pass. He threw for 328 or more yards in all of those games. Uh, 11 touchdown passes, but also seven interceptions. So remember, if you do are like, you know, you can, Mahomes can get counting stats. The Eagles can still get defensive stats too, or inversely uh, for, you know, Jalen Hurts and the Chiefs as well, because Jalen Hurts can score points rushing the football as well. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't think that we can outright fade him right on the two gamer where like both guys are 50, 50, maybe like uh, we would, there, there's really like no lean when I'm looking at projected ownership here that says like, all right, we got an advantage. On right, quarterback. right. And, and it's going to really dictate lineups, which is why I feel a little bit better about playing Jalen Hurts, too, because I know that Patrick Mahomes is on the other side. So no matter how much conviction about I have about Jalen Hurts, I don't need to be afraid that he's going to be overutilized right. because I know that Patrick Mahomes is on the other side of that seesaw. Um, I guess it probably would benefit us a little bit to kind of throw together because you can play both and, and I'm probably going to have to play a ton of both. But what I think a lot of people are going to do is they're going to start their lineups with something like Sanders or Pacheco, maybe Goddard even, but they're going to start with someone in like this 8K ish range. So I'm just going to start with Smith and then you can start with Hertz, Mahomes, and you still have plenty of money on the table. You're going to have to punt someone, but you're probably going to want to do that anyways. And most of your, anything over like a thousand to 2000 field, you're probably going to want to get your 10% to 15% own player in there. So you really don't need to go into this outright fading Patrick Mahomes just because you love Jalen hurts. It's more than likely that both of these quarterbacks are going to end up in the optimal lineup. Now, if you don't have Mahomes, let's make sure that we leverage that, right? Like let's make sure, okay, well, what's a bad Mahomes game look like? Because there's yeah. no way that he can have a good game and not be in the optimal lineup. Um, a good game for Patrick Mahomes is four touchdowns in, in 300 yards, right? He will not be um, omitted from the optimal lineup in that case. So that's why maybe get your Eagles defense exposure in there. Maybe get your Pacheco in there. Uh, McKinnon steals some or something like that. Gets back involved in the offense, something like that. But let's make sure if you're going to fade Patrick Mahomes, you pivot off of him. And then what about his running mate, Travis Kelsey? Do you have any any conviction on whether or not you want to play him? 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like that is going to be like the the most people that come in that haven't played Showdown this year. You know, they're going to want to play, if especially if they're playing Mahomes, you know, they're going to want to just inherently yeah. pair him with Kelsey, right? He's been the only constant for the Chiefs. The rest of the offense where the touchdowns have gone has, has really been kind of whack-a-mole. You know, early in the season, it was Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. He kind of then passed the touchdown baton to McCall Hardman, and then McCall Hardman got hurt, and then it was Jarek McKinnon. Uh, and, you know, so it's kind of oscillated around uh, quite a bit. The one constant's been Kelsey. I feel like he's the one guy that's probably going to be the – where everyone's going to come in and initially try yeah. to start there. Like he's going to be the guy up. where a lot of people yeah. try to build around him first. Yeah. And that's what DraftKings tried to do with his price at 10,600. They said, yeah, okay, well, we're going to take him 400 off of Patrick Mahomes. You're going to want to pair both of them, which always happens. Um, I wish that I had the data on this and I'm going to get better at collecting this ne next year, but with Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey lineups, I, I would venture to say that very, very few lineups include Mahomes and Kelsey. And that's something that I tried to target last week. Those lineups didn't work out. Thankfully I did have Mahomes and Kelsey lineups as well, but that is something when you know if people are clicking on Patrick Mahomes, they're also clicking on Travis Kelsey, and that's something right. that we can leverage here. So when I started those lineups with Devontae Smith, Jalen Hurts, and Patrick Mahomes, it doesn't leave a ton of money on the table. If you wanted to add Kelsey, you're going to go with two punts, which almost never works out. So you give yourself some natural leverage by playing Mahomes and then just taking a shot on Juju or Kadarius Tony or MVS, who will all carry low ownership or at least like 30% ownership. Um, Juju had a pretty high ownership because the 5.6K uh, last week, which he's also 5.6 this week, I believe, um, was kind of like a, a bit of a surprise. It was like, wait, why did you price him that way? And it didn't come to fruition because he got injured anyways. Um, but I don't think his ownership is going to be as, that, as high because we don't have that initial shock of seeming as though he was he was mispriced last week. So that's what I mean. You, you still might want to include Kelsey, and you could go on the flip side, right? And if you want to admit Patrick Mahomes, there have been situations like Cooper Cup's notorious for this, where he ends up in optimal lineups just because he's the focal point of the offense and the quarterback just doesn't quite make it because ends up being like 35% of the target share or something like that. And I could potentially see that if MBS doesn't show up and Juju's still dealing with injury and Tony's still dealing with injury or requires another one, unfortunately. I could certainly see Kelsey taking enough of the workload to be in optimal lineups. Um, you would be super unique if you ran like a five by one with Kelsey coming back. That would be a very good way to attack saying, hey, I want to play Travis Kelsey without Patrick Mahomes. How can I get the most leverage? You're probably going five by one with the Eagles and you're playing the Eagles defense, I would say. Yeah, that, yeah, definitely. That's the the way to go. I believe so as well. Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see just because that you, you know it was MVS in the AFC Championship game. Uh, yeah. Then it's all about just what what ancillary Chiefs guy is getting the touchdowns. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And and I don't want to forget about McKinnon either because just because he's been ghosted doesn't mean that he. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind getting Jarek McKinnon, Super Bowl MVP um, bets in there because. Who knows if this is just the game that he gets involved. I don't believe that he's in any sort of doghouse. I don't think that he's done anything necessarily wrong. He just hasn't been uh, – his his talents haven't been required in the matchups that they've had in the playoffs. So Jarek McKinnon might be that ancillary piece that we need as well. We have a bunch of player groups here that are priced really close together, I believe intentionally, and that is – the first one is A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. Um, I think they're interchangeable for me. I don't know that ownership is going to be very different between the two of them. They're both going to be between 35 to 40 percent ownership. So there's not really any leverage. I would just sprinkle them in. If you're playing single entry, you're having a tough decision, but then you could just go the route that I started the show with and Jalen Hurts, AJ Brown, and Devontae Smith. You start with those three and you've already got yourself a, a the making for a unique lineup. Um, then you don't have to make the decision. But if you have to make a decision between the two, do you have a lean between AJ Brown and Devontae Smith? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you look at the Eagles and when they do throw the ball, and this could be a situation, like I said, where they actually have to throw more, you know, if they're sure. actually trailing, you know, for, for once in right. a game. Uh, but when they do, no team tar targets their wide receivers at a higher rate than the Eagles in the NFL. They target their wide receivers 69.5% of the time. Nice. Uh, and... It's great is that we know who's getting the football. 
They target their yeah, receivers at the highest projectable. rate in the NFL. Those two players have 80% of the wide receiver targets. <laughs> of that. Like, those two players. And yeah. Zach Pascal's actually taken over and snaps over Quez Watkins, which makes it even less likely that any other wide receiver is going to be involved. Yeah, the, the Eagles only have four wide receivers all season with targets. Uh, the, the two guys that we talked that at the top, Devontae Smith, and then Zach Pascal and Quez Watkins have 73 total targets oh over 19 goodness. games combined. That's beautiful um, for us. Yeah, so it's great. The one thing with Pascal that's interesting is the last two weeks they've had – Remember, they've led 49 to 7 by a combined score sure. in the first half of these games. And he's a better run blocker, so he's been playing a lot more True. snaps. So if you think the Eagles are going to trail, you know, you're going to, and they have to play a lot more 11 personnel, that's where you would see kind of Quez Watkins get more of a back to like being a snap, a snap bump, like where you're trying to see, foresee an outcome, right? Like, all right, yep. if you have to drop back and throw a lot, then that's going to probably mean Watkins is on the field way more than he's been the past two games where the Eagles have just been pounding the rock in the second half uh, in these games and kind of skewing a little bit of that, the snap counts. We saw this, we've seen the same thing with Kenneth Gainwell who has 31 opportunities in the playoffs and he's had a nice spike, but in the first half of games, they haven't even been close. Like it's Joe sure. Miles Sanders is, sure. like, is kind of like the foxhole guy. Like he's Miles Sanders has played 43 snaps compared to 23 for Gainwell. Gainwell, like I said, has those 31 opportunities uh, but 22 of those have come in the second half of games and 18 have come in the fourth quarter of those games. You know, th th there could be a lot different run out here where if this game's competitive and you just don't see a lot of Kenneth Gainwell or Boston Scott because the Eagles are playing their best players. <laughs> that's that's going to, yeah, my favorite player of the slate, Miles Sanders, and his ownership's projected to be very low again after having a very low ownership last week. And he's had over the last three games, I think two of the games he had, only 12 opportunities, um, one target in two of those games. Another one, he had 17 opportunities, which is more on pace with what he's seen this year. But he had a, a nice run of 20-plus touch games or 20-plus opportunity games, and he was playing on a, a at least closer to 60% of the snaps rather than the 40% that we've seen. So just like you've seen the trends, um, and, and a lot of people are going to be following projections, which are following trends. So what you want to do to try to get leverage in these games is identify which trends are Fugazi, which is kind of what you've identified with Zach Pascal being a better pass blocker. And I, I'll add that um, Quez Watkins is usually in the $3,000 range and he's only 1200 for the slate. So he's uh, a much easier decision when you're talking about, so he's 1400. He's a much easier decision when you're deciding between Quez Watkins and Zach Pascal. Um, People might be tending to lean Zach Pascal in this case. I will say the last two games, Zach Pascal has had a higher snap share and Quez Watkins has still has slightly higher ownership. But I could definitely see that flipping after two weeks of people saying, okay, well, Zach Pascal really has taken over in that third wide receiver role. Well, it hasn't turned into any targets. So <laughs> it really hasn't mattered which of the two have played more snaps. But you're absolutely right. If, if they're going to be trailing or at least um, in a shootout, Quez Watkins, the preferred option, and that's pretty obvious for anybody who's seen the Eagles over the course of the season that Jalen Hurts does like Quez Watkins, and Quez Watkins does come up big on the limited opportunity that he's been targeted. Miles Sanders is another case where things just haven't really gone in a way that required Miles Sanders to be an active participant. The games have been out of hand in the first half, like you pointed out. So what's the point of mine? Miles Sanders playing 60% of the snaps when you have Kenneth Gainwell, who you would like to actually get more playoff experience because he's a young player came into the league, very raw and has done very well for himself. He's the player that you would want to get extra snaps to um, not necessarily Boston Scott, who has also been reasonably involved, almost as involved as Kenneth Gainwell in terms of snap share, but not in terms of opportunity share. And that's because they probably want Kenneth Gainwell to get his feet as wet as possible before the big game. So all that makes a ton of sense, but it also sets up for Miles Sanders to be more involved again. Um, if you're in a close competitive game, you could see Miles Sanders easily getting 20 to 25 touches in this game. And that would seemingly come out of nowhere for most people. But we saw that in the season. Right. So I, I think Miles Sanders is a huge pivot point, especially if you want to say. So the route earlier was I'm going to go very heavily in favor of Jalen Hurts, because if I want to play him, then I need to really lean in. Otherwise, I'm just matching the field. Well, the other route you can take if you still want Jalen Hurts to be in your optimal lineup is play Miles Sanders as, as captain, play Jalen Hurts in the flex, maybe play the Eagles defense and then play like three Chiefs. And then you can run a three by three and 
Miles Sanders potentially puts in two touchdowns or gets a hundred yard bonus or something like that. So there are routes to Miles Sanders succeeding and Jalen Hurts succeeding. Yeah, and we've seen that over the course of the season. I mean, you, you combine they have twenty eight rushing touchdowns. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, after and, zero the year before for Sanders, and zero for just... the year before for Miles Sanders. But you, you see a lot of these scenarios though over the course of the season where both guys get there, and you can you can almost put them together. And I imagine in showdown, you, you probably don't see it as often as you probably should, just because of the touchdown equity that both combined have. Yeah uh because you you generally think well if, if Jalen Hurts is rushing for all these touchdowns Miles Sanders and getting with also they score so many points right. uh it doesn't <laughs> right. matter and then I love Miles Sanders so like I was you know talking to Warren about like kind of as aggregating all of my bets across all different books and making sure what I had and I was surprised when I pulled everything together how much I had at stake on Miles Sanders uh <laughs> oh, you know man. player props uh <laughs> Just because, I mean, the, the scenario here is one. I think people are overvaluing the the split, the playoff split that him and Kenneth Gainwell had. It's like it's been circumstantial. Uh, but when the game's tight and the game's beyond the line, like this is implied in this game, it's going to be a lot more Miles Sanders. And the other great thing is, we have not seen the Kansas City Chiefs face very good run offenses over the course of the season, and they're very mediocre run defense, despite that right. very light strength of schedule obviously the eagles are number one in the nfl removing jalen hurts they're number one in the nfl and epa per rush with their running backs uh the chiefs have just faced three teams in the top 10 the raiders being the best running team that they have faced obviously josh jacobs is counting stats are going to be there but they allowed 130 rushing yards per game in those games and despite that light schedule the best they are 18th in epa allowed the running back 16th in yards per carry allowed the running backs uh, 19th in rate of those carries go for a first down or touchdown they're going to be having to punch up. If the Chiefs play, if this game is tight and the Eagles are in control, it's going to be because they're able to run the football uh, very, very effectively. So I love Miles Sanders uh, for that that regard as well. Uh, all his stuff was pretty low because the Eagles are, in general, when you look at their player prop stuff and it gets factored into like a lot of medium projections, is they're a tough team to look at medium projections for because their splits have been so cattywampus all season because they just mm -hmm. haven't played close games right, at all. Right the entire season and it's kind of really kind of skewed everybody throughout the course of the year just because in the second half they're not really doing anything right yeah yeah you almost have to go back and try to contextualize every game and that would take a ridiculous yeah. amount of time but if you really were able to go back and do that you would see that pretty much any time that there was meaningful football being played miles sanders was a focal point and that's not to say that he was he was never over a 60 percent player but 60 percent is still plenty in today's nfl at running back you're still a quality starter at 60 percent of the snaps it really matters more are you in on critical downs which miles sanders is as he demonstrated with his two touchdowns last week on i think 43 percent of the snaps and he had like i said 12 opportunities in that game so uh it, i mean his uh his yards per carry were fine if you wanted to look at that like there was nothing to point at miles sanders having a bad game um outside of the touchdown so if you if you were somebody that's looking at a reason to not play miles sanders and you're like well it was just it was only 12 opportunities well when did you want him to get more opportunities the game was completely out of hand by the second half there's if you just looked at the first half, you wouldn't even have enough competitive football to um, say one way or the other whether Miles Sanders is a trusted asset in the offense, which I believe he definitely is. So Miles Sanders is someone that I think you can use to um, use to leverage. You can also use him like if you think that it doesn't get to 51, because that's mm -hmm. another way to um, leverage the field in showdown is by saying, well, what happens if this is a low scoring game? Well, probably a lot of Miles Sanders still a ton of Jalen Hurts, because I've talked a lot over the season about the fact that it really doesn't take a lot for a quarterback to get into the optimal lineup in a low scoring game. It's harder for a quarterback to end up in the optimal lineup in a high scoring game. Usually in a high scoring game, you're going to get one quarterback in a lot of cases. Um, in low scoring game, super easy because the quarterback only needs like a touchdown, maybe some rushing yards if you're Jalen Hurts, um, 200 passing yards, something like that. Like a Kenny Pickett stat line is uh, all you really need in a low scoring game to get into the optimal lineup. So in that case, you're talking about Jalen Hurts, Miles Sanders in the flex, and then you have to hit on your skill position player at captain. But the next two players, Pacheco and McKinnon, this is something that DraftKings has been working on refining all season. I ended up playing, a, they had a lot of featured slates for the Chiefs, so I've had a lot of experience with trying to figure out Pacheco and, and Jarek McKinnon's situation. And McKinnon was 
I want to say at the height of all those touchdowns, he was like $2,000 more than Pacheco. And then Pacheco finally overtook him in the playoffs. And now it's basically DraftKings is saying, here, you figure it out. Similar <laughs> to what they're doing with Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes. You've got Isaiah Pacheco at 7,200, Jarek McKinnon at 6,800. I will say that Jarek McKinnon's ownership was egregiously low last week. I thought it was way, way too low. Obviously, I was wrong because he had like five DraftKings points. But it seemed way too low for someone who I thought should have a lot of involvement in a meaningful playoff game. Isaiah Pacheco had that awesome looking touchdown. I mean, he looks like he's shot out of a rocket every time he gets a hole, man. It, it, it looks incredible when Isaiah Pacheco touches the ball. And I think that that actually kind of wears off and, and kind of leaks into his showdown ownership too, because he just seems like somebody that you want to invest in when you catch a glimpse of him. But I don't know if I'm going to be super involved in either of them. I do think if I had to lean one, I'm going to pick McKinnon because of the uh, ownership discount I believe that I will get. But do you have a lean on either of those running backs? Yeah, it's very tough to diagnose the situation because, you know, last week Pacheco kind of had the the job to himself. You know, he outsnapped yep. McKinnon by 12 snaps. It was the first game this entire season that he ran more pass routes than Jarek McKinnon, uh, which was something we typically never seen from Pacheco, and that's allowed right. him to have that high floor. He, he didn't run the ball effectively in the AFC Championship game at all, but, you know, he had five catches for 60 yards and, you know, all season highs across the board. The other element in play here, too, is that Clyde edwards Slayer is going to be active on Sunday. I don't know what that means as far as him actually touching the football field, but it does throw another wrinkle into things. Uh, sure. And anytime you see a veteran like McKinnon, where he was kind of the guy that was the pass protector for Patrick Mahomes with his hurt ankle against the Jaguars, lose the amount of snaps he had in kind of a game that is in a similar role and was tight throughout. Like mm -hmm. you have to wonder like how healthy was he? Is there something right. more that we don't know about that? Why there was just this dramatic shift in usage between the two players, right? Cause it was, it was a complete flip. Like Pacheco was yeah. used in a different capacity. He had been used the entire season leading into the AFC championship right. game. So was McKinnon fully healthy? Do we did something happen in game? These are all things like we don't really know. You add, like I said, CH being in this game, and like it's it, it does it throws a lot of variance into the into the hopper here. It does. I I don't envy anybody doing projections to try to figure <laughs> out how how often CH touches the ball. I would venture to say very little. Um, but I don't envy that situation. The problem with the Chiefs is you never know what the hell they're going to do inside the five yard line. Oh like, yeah, well. They, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just think back to the very first play of Clyde. Well, not the first play, the very first drive of Clyde edwards helaire career. And, you know, Dynasty Twitter has been in an uproar for weeks because he's gone from the RB5 to the RB1. And now we finally get to see him play and he gets to the goal line stuffed three times in a row. And it's like you never really saw that opportunity again after the first game of his career. <laughs> so no, I don't. Yeah, but yeah. you don't really know, like. I, I want to say it's McKinnon. I want to say it's McKinnon in pass, passing situations inside the five because whatever the issue was, I would imagine was resolved in the the last two weeks. I mean, they've had a lot of time. And like you said, Pacheco's role was way different than we've seen. Now, did he do well enough in that role to secure it? I mean, that touchdown looked really good and, and it counts to everybody except for the scoreboard. So um, I do believe that he earned himself an increased role, but I don't know that that's what they want him to do. They'd rather him be that 10 carry bruiser and McKinnon get those five targets. Uh, at one point in the season, I think at the, the end of the season, McKinnon was leading the league in receiving touchdowns for a portion of time. Um, so why would that have just gone away in the playoffs? Like, like you said, I thought the Bengals game was okay. McKinnon's going to be back. Something was going on that, that was definitely a game that they needed him and he wasn't involved. So I wish we heard something in the media that said, oh, this is why Jarek McKinnon wasn't involved as much. But we didn't, and that's going to lead to a, a great ownership discount. I know that Pacheco is going to be probably doubly as owned as McKinnon. Uh, so if you – I mean, look, showdown, you got to roll the dice. So I'm just going to look at the, the aggregate of the season and just say – McKinnon was one of the focal points of their offense for a period of time. Um, it's hard to say that he just disappeared. I think in single entry and three max, he's not going to be owned enough to where it even really, really matters unless he really breaks the slate. So you might not need to go there, but like in large field 20 max that I'm playing, I'm probably going to have a, at least more than the field of McKinnon. 
Yeah, Dallas he's Goddard. probably a guy oh, that uh, he's probably a guy that you'll you want to play in. You know, if the, if you're playing for this game to also you know go under, yeah, right? Because oh, you're because yeah, because you want the touchdown equity. Like you're playing exactly. for the you're playing for the touchdown. Yeah, I I think about it this way a lot, and I haven't really been able to put it in words throughout the season. But low scoring games turn into like a a touchdown parlay, really. Yes. Um, and that's when you're kind of <laughs> running into the situation where okay, well then you needed McKinnon's two touchdowns, right? Even if it only culminates in ten DraftKings points, that's points that were taken away from other players in that game. So that's where you needed that equity from Jarek McKinnon. But again, with Ceh's involvement, we don't know what what that's going to do either. I mean, he has been trusted in third down situations in the past. I don't know if he was the preferred option. Jarek McKinnon was hurt so often. It's really hard to say when Clyde Edwards Hilaire was actually the preferred option. Um, but I think it's really a, a, the decisions between Pacheco and McKinnon. And that's because I, I like some of the bump plays a little more than CEH down at the bottom. Anyways. Right, right. Yeah. I don't know how um, you actually click CEH's name and maybe that's something that, that, that you just had to get over, but like, yeah, I don't know how you would actually click it. Well, yeah, somebody wins a million dollars when CEH punches in a touchdown from like the 11 or something. But yeah, if you're playing like in the yeah. Millie Maker or something, sure. But like anything in reasonable stakes, uh, <laughs> right. there's no reason to click the button. Right. Absolutely. So then the next <laughs> plays Dallas Goddard looked way too expensive to me last week when he was 6,800. I thought that that was uh, absolutely out of control. But now at 6,400, he looks like a, a very strong play. And that's just because you have McKinnon, Pacheco, Sanders, Smith, all of those guys above Dallas Goddard. So it's like a really expensive slate. It's a really top heavy slate. Um, everything dwindles after Goddard, which is good or bad, depending on how you look at it, because you're going to have a lot, a lot of options to get different after we get through Dallas Goddard. But He's the best way to get passing exposure to Hertz while saving enough money to mm -hmm. um, run back some cheap options, chief options you feel good about. Because like I said earlier, once you've clicked on Hertz, Smith, and AJ Brown in any capacity, you're pretty much just going all in on the the Eagles because you're not going to put together a lineup after that that is conducive to the Chiefs also having similar success. You're not going to be able to run like a a Patrick Mahomes three by three with that. Like you can't play Hertz and Patrick Mahomes. But if you run Dallard and play uh Dallas Goddard in place of AJ Brown, now you've offered yourself enough flexibility to play some of the Chiefs guys um, as a run back option to Jalen Hurts. So like you mentioned earlier, wide receivers get a ton of love, but Dallas Goddard has had a decent amount of um a decent target share over how many weeks has it been since he's been healthy? I know that he, so he had a little stint there where he was injured, but since he's been back, he's been pretty involved in the offense and he's not going to go overlooked by anybody because he's the, uh, I guess, I guess skeleton key, if you will, to fitting um, quality chiefs and Eagles lineups. Uh, but he's definitely a valuable option. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about like he's going to be with so many people just naturally taking Kelsey. You probably won't see a lot of, you know, where Kelsey is, you know, um, you, where, where you're going to get two tight ends. Right. Even on a, even on yeah. showdown, you probably aren't going to see a lot of Kelsey and Goddard together. Uh, you're you're going to probably see Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown be kind of the popular, you know, stacking guys with Jalen Hurts. And you have Goddard third and you're for good reason. But mm -hmm. he's a, when, when this world of salary cap that we live in, he fits in. Right. Plus, he's leverage on Kelsey. There's a lot of avenues here where Dallas Goddard is kind of like a, one of the key pieces to this game and this, you know, small, you know, one game slate here. Uh, and he could be a guy that acts absolutely, you know, is is the one guy you have to have. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned that people probably don't. I don't know why, but people do not like to click on two tight ends. That's yeah. why on all these chief slates, I always end up with a ton of lineups with uh, Travis Kelsey and then Noah Gray as my fun option because it's just something that people don't like to click on. Actually, a lot of people probably put in their optimizer rules to not include two tight ends from the same team, and I bet you that's why it never yeah. happens. But when you're talking about a pump play, I just need two catches from Noah Gray, and he makes value like every week. So, <laughs> spoiler alert, I'm probably going to have – a good bit of Noah Gray coming up. But with uh, Marquez Valdez-Scantling pricing, I feel like I could kiss DraftKings for this because last week he had that that huge game and then they priced him all the way up to 6200 and made him like not a very viable option, which makes him a great option for us again. Last week he was a good option just because those players were so cheap, like all the receivers for the Chiefs were so cheap that you basically just had to get whatever one was going to pop off. 
but um, his ownership still came in really low because he hadn't had a productive game in like seven or eight weeks or something like that. So at that point, it was basically, like, well, I guess this is going to be my week uh, to donate to the Marcos Valdez Gantling Fund. And he actually uh, ended up ended up panning out last week. And then now we're coming into a situation where he's probably going to be like 20 percent owned again. And that's just because he had that really productive week last week, got probably too much of an overcorrection of a price bump. Um Everyone else is going to keep in mind that Juju was hurt and Kadarius Tony was hurt, while DraftKings apparently did not because they priced him at six thousand two hundred. So he definitely is not worth six thousand two hundred. But we have to remember in DraftKings these plays are so good that they're or so bad that they're good, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it is interesting about you know pairing the, the the double tight ends. Kelsey's their wide receiver anyway. He's their wide receiver one. Yeah, so you just exactly that's how that's the story I tell myself too. I mean, I just anytime that I I land on one of those lineups, I'll I'll scroll through my twenty max after I've built it and just make sure that everything seems relatively viable without trying to put my fingerprint on it too much because then I'm just going to tinker. And anytime I land on Kelsey and Noah Graham, I'm just like, well, Kelsey's not really a tight end, so I'm I'm good with this. <laughs> but that brings us down to skip all these quarterbacks. Obviously, Juju Smith Schuster is 5,600. Talked about earlier last week, it was a little bit of a shock. Like, why was he priced so cheaply? And then he ends up getting hurt. So it never came to fruition, anyways. But now he's cheaper than Marquez Valdez Gantling. So it's like, well, last week he had that ownership because he was so cheap. This week he's the exact same price. Um, and he's still going to have relatively high ownership, not so much because he's so cheap but because Marquez Valdez Scantling is more expensive than him. So it's really easy to put a lineup together and then just be like, wait, why would I click on MVS and not Juju Smith-Schuster? Well, you don't because you're probably going to get twice the ownership, but uh, with similar opportunity. Uh, but if Juju Smith-Schuster's healthy, he was an eight target player throughout the year. Actually, it was kind of scary how often he was targeted eight times. And this is as if he was like on a target counter, but um you know, MVS doesn't really get that kind of opportunity, but it's been a while since Juju Smith Schuster's gotten that opportunity as well. So I don't really have a strong lean on Juju in this game, other than he's going to be someone that I'm fine sprinkling in here and there, um, just as a player that can produce on eight targets. Yeah, the the non Chiefs uh, Kelsey guys are going to be real hard again this week. You know, we have Mikel Hardman's going to be out this game, so Justin Watson's going to be back up, and he had an illness last week. Yeah. Uh, we had both Tony and Juju leave the game last week, so how healthy are they coming into this right. week? Right? Are they going to have their normal you know snap allotment? Is it going to be something where like they just are rotating a lot of these guys? They've done that a few times this season, where because we've seen Juju since he had his concussion. Uh, he's come back and his, his snap rate has dropped. His route participation has dropped. I mean, he's he's got three or fewer catches now in eight of his past 10 games. He's gone over 38 yards in just two of those games. Yep. Uh, he scored a touchdown in one of his past 11 games. Like, But this is like those are the numbers that are going to push people off of him, right? right. So you want to get uh, exposure to him if he's going to be really low owned, especially if you're on the Mahomes side, right? Like, Because that's just the way to get unique. Uh, you know, if Mahomes throws three passing touchdowns and Juju even has one, you're you're doing you're you're already in, in really good shape. Uh, sure. If he only has two passing touchdowns, like last week, right? Like where it was just MVS and Kelsey, and Kelsey's the chalk play, and you got the other guy right. So, like you know, that's that's where you are if it's a lower scoring game too for Mahomes, uh, and Juju is the guy that has the touchdown, but. Uh, very hard to diagnose like the the outside of MVS, like where the actual snap counts are going to lie for the Chiefs guys because sure. we don't really know how healthy Tony and Juju are. And Tony's another guy. He's, he The most pass routes he's running a game this year is 17. Yeah, we like, might as well <laughs> include him in the conversation. Yeah, so his his route participation is awful, but his um, opportunity his, yeah. share is incredibly high. Um, yeah, he's got one of the probably – probably one of the highest um, target percentages on routes run in, in the NFL this season. It's got to be, yeah, it's, it's been egregious how often he's been targeted when he's on the field. It's just that he hasn't been on the field. Yeah. They're calling often. plays for him when he's in the game. Yeah. Ex in exactly. And the, I mean, the play he hurt his foot on was even an electric cut that would have been incredible if he didn't, you know, he might take that another 40 yards. I, I mean, my, my leg shatters if I try to make that cut on a dime <laughs> that he tried to make. So it's not a surprise that um, 
Pazuda always talks point about point on point. our podcast too. That's why he ends up getting hurt so much, just because the human body is not supposed to move like right. his moves. Uh, he he's very unique in that regard, and I guess he's not that unique is just because like the it, it falls apart. He, he hasn't been able to withstand because uh, he's such a, a unique mover, right? Like when he has yes, the football, like no no player moves like him. But yeah. also, it's probably a good uh, fulcrum point for how many times he's had the injuries to his lower extremities that he's had. Cause I mean, that cut is amazing. And he doesn't even touch though and is out of the game. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and that's another reason. I mean, so when I came into this week and I fell in love with all of these Eagle stacks that I've been really harping on. And then I really asked myself, well, if I'm falling in love with them this early in this week, so is everybody else. But mm-hmm. I kind of, I don't actually necessarily believe that at this point, because as we go through these Chiefs players, it feels like the the Chiefs story writes itself, like the Chiefs lineups are going to be so easy to put together. You're just going to put Patrick Mahomes at captain and you're going to click on a crap ton of Chiefs ancillary pieces. And um, so as if the so the players ownership individually, like Juju is going to be around 30 percent and. Um, could t- could Air Tony is going to be around 25 and MVS is going to be around 20, but those players together are going to make up a, a big portion of Patrick Mahomes' lineups. Um, so if you can just if you just are underweight on all of the Chiefs receivers and just take that stand, like okay, well, I just don't think the Chiefs are going to have a ton of success through the air, or I think they're only going to have success through the air with Travis Kelsey, it makes you feel a lot more comfortable about heavily stacking the Eagles, even if you believe that a lot of people are going to feel good about heavily stacking the Eagles. Well, that's not necessarily true when we're seeing that Patrick Mahomes is going to be 50% owned and it's really hard to play both of those quarterbacks together. What are you going to do if you play Patrick Mahomes a captain, especially when his captain ownership is looking like 20%, 20 to 30%, which is a lot for a quarterback. It's normal for Patrick Mahomes, but it's a lot for a quarterback. Okay, well, if he's at captain, people surely aren't single stacking uh, Patrick Mahomes at captain. So now you've got Lock Kelsey in. Kelsey's going to be in pretty much every lineup that has Patrick Mahomes at captain. Now, where did they go? Well, it's going to be at least one of Juju, MVS, and Tony. Uh, Watson's going to be another ancillary piece uh, later. Maybe Sky Moore, but I've been successful not playing him all year. And and so Chiefs once too. you yeah exactly. <laughs> so once you get to the point where you're like, what are these lineups going to look like when you get to that twenty to thirty percent of Patrick Mahomes at captain? All right, well now these guys aren't such. It, it, I would rather take the approach of playing Patrick Mahomes at in the flex with just one of these guys, and if you hit on like an MVS week again, you you've hit at that point. It's just tough because now you're admitting Travis Kelsey in that case, right? So we're down to the ancillary pieces now and not a ton to harp on on any of these guys. Once I get down to the the punt plays, I'm more trying to talk myself out of them than trying to talk myself into them because I really want to just be in on a couple of these guys. In the grand scheme of things, they're probably not going to end up mattering. If one of them gets a touchdown, you weren't sniffing the top of the leaderboards without them anyway. So you really just want to try to get, like you talked about earlier, like that was a huge that's that's a, a major point in the fa- in favor of Quez Watkins over Zach Pascal that I and probably a lot of people haven't really considered because when you're just locked into a rhythm of what you're doing on the years, looking at the last X amount of games or their snap percentage and looking at trends, it looks like Zach Pascal has taken over that role. But Zach Pascal has done absolutely nothing in the two games, like literally nothing. I don't think he's been targeted in the two games that he's been leading in snap share. So obviously we're so we're getting Quez Watkins at a two thousand dollar discount just because he's done nothing either but if we tell ourselves a story where a wide receiver has to do something it's going to be Quez Watkins right so I think here I'm looking at Noah Gray Quez Watkins and Justin Watson I don't know do you do you have any love for Boston Scott in this game it would have to be the, your scenario right where like you're you're predicting like a, the Eagles to flood the Chiefs like yeah. they have in other games. And then, then in that scenario, you wouldn't play Miles Sanders, right? Like, you know, right. potentially. Uh, and you'd be play, taking a shot on, you know, just a cleanup touchdown. And you're really just chasing a touchdown of Boston Scott. He's never had double-digit touchdowns or touches in, yep. in a game yet yep. this season. So if he doesn't get you a touchdown, you have absolutely nothing. Um, yep. the, we, you know, we didn't really talk about Gainwell. Like the same thing with Gainwell. Oh, is like you have, to, you have to – if you're going to play Gainwell, you play him in your Chiefs lineups – because right. that's how he gets there. 
uh, in terms of usage. Because if you look at where Gain Gainwell still has like a clear cut edge in transparency versus Miles Sanders is playing on pure passing situations. Miles Sanders has played just seven third down passing snaps the entire year. And we talked about earlier that, you know, Jalen Hurts has only thrown 22 passes trailing his second half all season. It's a scenario we haven't seen the Eagles in. So if you're projecting the Chiefs to score a lot of points, like your Mahomes stack, right? Yeah. Like you, that's when you would play gain well, not in your Eagle stacks. Sure, sure. And yeah, we're in the part of the show where we're going to build anyway. So let's just go ahead and put that together. Um, this is a point where I usually start building on some of the things that I've talked about throughout the show to give a little bit of practical mm -hmm. application on kind of what I was talking about. But I mean, if you start this lineup with Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, now you're in a position, you're you're going to triple stack Mahomes and you should triple stack Mahomes. So let's put in, I guess, Juju's probably going to be the most popular, right? So this is probably going to be the most likely scenario for the Chiefs stacks and kind of why I don't go there. Now you could leave it at this, but usually you're going to click one more guy. Like, I don't know, do you want to go Justin Watson here or um, – MVS I would lean MVS just because like we know that he is the health he's healthy right like sure. we know he's going to like his snaps really aren't going to be compromised sure sure and this is why I feel good about the Eagles lineups because yes this is exactly what everybody who puts Patrick becomes a captain is going to end up landing on yes. for the exact reason that you just said. So now we're in a position where we pretty much have to click on Kenneth Gainwell because that's how much we have left. And now once you get to this point, I say just play the Chiefs defense. Um, but you could do like Tony and quadruple stack, but that's a that's a fine line because like triple stacking is where it's like, yeah, you probably want to triple stack a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes. But when you get into quadruple stacking, it's really better for lower scoring games because not a lot of players on either side of the ball get a lot of a right. lot of touches, but it doesn't really make any sense. So you probably want to go like Chiefs here or something. But I guess the the moral of the story here is you really back yourself into a corner where you're not actually yes. you're not actually being unique anymore just because you seem to have a, a lower cumulative ownership. If you were to go with the Chiefs, this is why I think it's better to just try to figure out how you feel about the Eagles. Cause if mm -hmm. you do literally what we just, did, so let's do what we just did, but with the Eagles, because people don't want to do that. They don't want to triple stack Jalen hurts. They want to triple stack my home. So if you just go hurts, AJ Brown, Devonte Smith, lean into Quez Watkins that you talked about earlier. Now you have so much more room for flexibility. You have $7,000 per player left. Yeah. You can't do Patrick Mahomes anymore. Like what happened? Well, I mean, I guess you could if you go down to what, like Mahomes and Watson or Mahomes and Noah Gray, like then mm -hmm. you connect on a touchdown. Um, that could be fine, I guess. Uh, maybe Patrick Mahomes is healthy enough to like get a fluke touch, a fluke rushing touchdown. But this is kind of what I talked about earlier with um, with Patrick Mahomes and like an ancillary piece in the flex, but I wasn't quite talking like if Patrick Mahomes has a really good play, he's dragging a lot better than Noah Gray up with them. So yes. we probably have to tweak <laughs> this around a little bit to do something like maybe Smith at captain gives us enough room to get up to maybe a Juju. Uh, that would be much more practical. 4,300. So you'd have to toy around with that a lot. Now you probably do. I, well, actually I'll probably rethink this earlier, but I was going to say, I usually have a rule where I'm not playing two alpha receivers like T Higgins and Jamar Chase. I'm probably not going to play them in the same lineup if one of them is at captain. So in this case, you would just free yourself up some room and you would go with Miles Sanders here. And now you can afford Juju, but you're only leaving a hundred on the table. So it's still worth messing around with this more. You could still do like, I'm not saying don't play Zach Pascal. Either way, you probably need a long catch from one of these guys. It's just probably coming from Quez Watkins, but it's right. a lot easier to play around with this. Uh, just play Patrick Mahomes with not Travis Kelsey and then play four Eagles than it is to just yes. play literally the lock at, with the Chiefs. Like there's really not many ways to get around how to stack Patrick Mahomes at captain. And what's interesting, you're building a better lineup and, and going against the grain of the field. <laughs> Right, right. It, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, yeah, I would venture to say, like, yeah, once once these are run through the optimizer, I'm probably going to see that the Eagles stacks have a higher um, median projection and 
like I said, they're not going to have lower cumulative ownership, but cumulative ownership can be deceiving when like so many people are going to end up having to fall on the same sword because there's only so many different ways you can go, especially if we don't get like Justin Watson's completely, you know, whatever. It, so it was an illness. So we're going to assume that he's totally fine. But I guess my, my point is we don't have any like leans on where, where the chiefs are going to go with the wide receivers, all healthy and how healthy are all the wide receivers. Yeah, that, that's what makes it so hard. And, and, and it's easy. to the, the Eagles, too, what's great about the Eagles and the Eagles stacks is they have multiple avenues of game script to kind of hit, right? Like, sure. if they're in kind of their base offense throughout, like, the, throughout the course of the game, like, they're one of the most versatile offenses in the NFL. So there are just a lot of ways to get there. The Chiefs, it's hard to say, like, the Chiefs are going to have a 30-point game and it's going to involve, you know, two Patrick Mahomes touchdowns and two rushing touchdowns. Right? Sure. Like that's not the way they operate. Right. Like the Eagles totally do operate in that capacity when they're right. on schedule. Right. Oh, and yep, before we get out of here, that mean that's the the last point that I wanted to make is if you just go um that route essentially, Miles Sanders at captain, Jalen Hurts, yeah. um probably like a let's do Smith just to save a little bit of money. Let's go Eagles. Um and then I think I had Juju earlier, but I actually, yeah, Juju's there. Oh, and then you could fit AJ Brown, but that only leaves a hundred. So you would go like Juju or what you probably would want to do here um, is Dallas Goddard instead of Smith. And then you could play MVS and then you could play like an AJ Brown or you could do Kelsey. Um, something that goes underutilized a lot is two receivers from the same team without their quarterback in the flex is actually not that terrible a thing, especially when you have MVS who can get a lot done on um, one play. So it's not, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to click Travis Kelsey here, but it feels a little bit better to just lean into if I'm going to play the Eagles and I'm going to play Miles Sanders and I'm probably just going to go Eagles five by one and this is where you throw in MVS or you throw in Juju and you try to catch that one big game from one of the ancillary pieces that aren't Kelsey yeah and you could have fit Mahomes in that too with yep. uh, Juju instead of MVS like there's a lot of avenues to go oh, uh, I think with Miles Sanders you know at captain yep great point let me yep yeah, and you're still leaving 500 salary on the table, and you get both quarterbacks in, and you're still playing a captain that's going to be like 5% owned a captain, Miles Sanders, and only like 20% in the flex. And you're playing a player that, like, literally last week had, um, yeah, maybe he only had 12 opportunities, but that's all I need. And he scored two touchdowns. So, um, yeah, you can get a lot done by just going not Jalen, an eagle that's not Jalen Hurts at captain four Eagles and just go from there. Yeah. But, and, uh, you know, uh, typically you see a lot of people that come in uh, from the, 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 the main slate players are probably always going to play a quarterback at captain, right? Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, the most comfortable thing is to play quarterback at captain because then you get the, I like to think of showdown is all about how much control you're willing to give up. Cause yeah. as, as people, as DFS players, we want to control everything in a game that we have zero control over. So as people that are way better at DFS than me start to realize is that if you just if you just attack the fact that other people want control and you accept the fact that you don't have control over the outcome, then you can that's where you start finding a little bit of your leverage, right? So I'm not saying you never play a quarterback, but you play a quarterback certain ways. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into fields that are like 2,000 or greater, I like to just let me sprinkle in a little bit less of the quarterbacks that captain a little bit more of their position players and then get a little more different, like throwing the Eagles in or throwing Elliott in. Like we didn't talk about the kickers, but obviously they are um, viable as well in a 51 point over under. Right. So the, the kickers are always interesting whenever they're going to be about 30% owned. I'll probably be under on them, but I, if they're going to be in the 20 percent, I'm usually going to be overweight on the kickers too. So that's my last tidbit on, on this slate. Do you have anything else for today? No, I mean, it's a, it's an exciting slate. And obviously this game pops, it's going to be a super fun showdown slate. So oh, yeah. there's so many guys that could, that could end up getting there. Uh, it's interesting because the Eagles have like a core group of guys that touch the football and like the chiefs are just so spread out to where it makes yep. it kind of maddening, but 
with Mahomes being right there with Hurts, like he's your quarterback is going to inherently draw ownership for the stacking guys, right? Right. right. That's that's tried and true. Whether you're playing showdown or main slate, like people, if you're if you're playing the quarterback, everyone has been indoctrinated into playing his pass catchers. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And in most cases, you need to. I mean, unless you like. Yeah, maybe I'll be a little bit mad if we find out that someone won a million dollars with Jalen Hurts in a single stack when he's at captain. <laughs> like that's a little frustrating, but also that's in the range of outcomes for Jalen Hurts, and it's not for Patrick Mahomes. Right. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me for this uh, last showdown slate of the season, man. It's been really fun over here at SharpFootballAnalysis.com. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we will catch you all not next week, but next year. Peace.